It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. And welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Want to thank everybody for checking in, listening to uh, to the interviews that you do check out throughout the week. I always love hearing from the comment boxes and the various places you can you can listen from. Uh, of course, those places do include iTunes and Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you can get podcasts from. We release new ones every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you're not already a subscriber, maybe hit that subscribe button. Let us uh, bring some interviews to you so you can keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones, know what's happening in the music world. Again, just type in Kyle Meredith with wherever you get podcasts from. I'm Kyle Meredith, and today I'm going to be talking with Mr. Paul Banks. Yes, you do know him as the lead singer of Interpol, Banks and Steel. Uh, he's got a brand new project called Muzz. This is with uh, two of his buddies. One of those is Josh Kaufman, the uh, producer, multi-instrumentalist, one-third of Bonnie Light Horseman, and also Matt Barrick, the drummer of The Walkman, uh, Jonathan Fire Eater. He's also played with the Fleet Foxes touring band, so they've got together for a self-titled record that is just kind of hauntingly beautiful. We're going to be talking about, first, how we met Josh way back in elementary school in Spain, and they're still friends and collaborators, and even how the song Stairway to Heaven played a big part in, in their friendship. Paul seeing the Walkman and Jonathan Fire Eater in the really early days, and of course he's used Matt and uh, Banks and Steels as well. And really just, you know, what he gets out of trios, you know, these days Interpol is a trio too. It really does seem like three is the magic number for what uh, Paul Banks likes to be a part of. He's also finding joy in recording, and that's something he says he he hasn't always found. Uh, It's definitely happening with Interpol, as he'll tell you, and especially with this Muzz record. Though, the themes on the Muzz record might not be all about joy. In fact, uh, Paul's going to say that mental health plays a big part in what he's singing about on this record. So we'll hear exactly why that is, and, and what mental health means to the artistic community these days. Is it something that's actually talked about, not just in interviews, but, you know, between musicians as well. Uh, you'll, you'll hear about the song Red Western Sky, a song that's actually really looking and begging for help and, and direction in life. And we'll also talk about the classic sound that the band's talked about wanting to go for. Uh, name dropping Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, that's all in there. And of course, we'll get an update on the future. Uh, Paul says he wants to make another Banks and Steels record. And also Interpol's definitely going to be making more records as well. So let's jump into it. Talking about this new project called Muzz. It's Kyle Meredith with Paul Banks. Hi, it's Paul. Let me start with the compliments then, because Muzz, it is quite the surprise for, for me. And, and what I think beautiful is the right word. Uh, it's it's a dark record, of course, I guess, but it's still really interesting to listen to. So I want to compliment you on, on how much I've enjoyed checking out this record. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess Thank you to, much. To, to get the story behind it, too, because... You know the creation story in this. As I as I read, what's caught me really off guard is you and Josh go all the way back to childhood in school together, but that school is in Spain. And I thought, what are the odds of that? How how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I was living in Madrid with my family from age twelve to fifteen, or seventh through tenth grade, and going to the American School of Madrid. And Josh showed up. I think it was my sophomore year, and was sat next to me in English class. I guess we had lockers next to each other as well. And my memory is that we would crack each other a lot, you know, crack each other up a lot in class and get in a little bit of trouble with the teacher. And that then shortly thereafter, there was some kind of talent show and Josh played Stairway to Heaven. Uh, And I'd been playing guitar for a couple of years at that point since seventh grade. And he was like the greatest guitar player I'd ever seen, just like from another planet, even just playing Stairway. So I think when you're that age, kind of like 15, and you're an aspiring rock musician, if there's somebody else that you know you think is cool who completely shreds on the guitar, it's like an automatic kind of bond and a magnetism. So we were just really close friends, and he sort of became a guitar mentor for me throughout my life as just being somebody with oodles more talent than I have on a guitar. Kind of, he's like in a very special group that I think... Uh, 
Mike from Ratatat, I put him in this group, mm-hmm. uh, and and Josh kind of. <laughs> it's like really not a long list of people that I consider to just be, you know, they got like a triple helping of talent with regards to their instrument. So he's always been really a phenomenal player. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's still like you know, there's there's eight billion people on the planet to have, to have, and. and for the amount of people that we, you know, make friends with in our childhood to still be able to be creatively working with them in this capacity all these years later, there's something special about that, I guess. That's 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 got to be a really rare instance. I mean, it feels that way to me. It feels pretty cosmic to me. It feels quite beautiful. But I, I've always kind of had a sense like I, I have some pretty phenomenal friends, to be honest. <laughs> I was lucky. Yeah, he's just one of them. And the other one there, of course, in the bat, we're talking about uh, uh, Matt as well. And, you know, my knowledge of you all, Matt's relationship, of course, is just because of of what I've read with the scene and everything. Matt goes back to Jonathan Fire Eater and the Walkman. And and what I like about this partnership, and I know it's not the first time you guys have, have worked together, but of all the bands that come out in that scene that we've all, you know, read about and known about for the decades now in that New York City scene, you and the Interpol and the Walkman seem to have been like the closest musical brothers, I guess is what I'm getting to. There was always something about your all's music that complemented each other. And it was, was that something that brought you and Matt together in, in a natural sense? I mean, I, I think in a way, yeah, the, the Walkmen were always, I mean, I, I had seen Jonathan Fire Eater play with Blonde Redhead in New York way back in the day. And then when the Walkmen formed Interpol and the Walkmen like shared a stage a couple of times, I think maybe like a New York showcase show or maybe we were just on the same bill together and just i was always a huge fan of the walkman and matt's one of my all-time favorite drummers and i feel like anyone who's ever seen them live kind of knows you just sort of can't help but gravitate your gaze towards you know the guy in the back just kind of going ham like animal (laughs) from the muppets and i think but he's also what i think is really special about his role in muzz is that i think you really see another side of his musicianship where it's not kind of all that propulsive heavy rock you know, style drumming, it's like often really minimal and just kind of like, I've, I've referred to it before as like painfully tasteful. <laughs> painfully tasteful. It's a, there, there's a moment on the record, I, I think, really where the two of you all's, uh, really, you know, um, partnership shines. And, and for me, that's on the song, How Many Days. Oh, cool. Just hearing what you're doing, locking in with those drums in, in such an interesting way. I didn't know if there was a, a story behind that, but I thought I'd ask. Well, How Many Days is was a key song in the history of Muzz because Matt and I were playing together with the Banks and Steels project. Mm-hmm. He was um, our drummer. And so he and I at one point were just kind of rehearsing and jamming and working on some of my solo material. And one of them was How Many Days. And we he got that really crazy beat going. And that was kind of like the first time where it was sort of like, OK, cool. Like there's something that we could do here. Then he and I were rehearsing on another occasion. He said, you know, I've done a, multiple sessions with your old friend Josh, and I really like working with that guy. Maybe we should call him to join in on this. And it was just one of those things where it kind of, without any hesitation, was like, absolutely, let's definitely do that. Then Josh came in, and then everything kind of, then Muzz really started to take shape. But uh, yeah, How Many Days was one of the very first pieces. You, and here you are now, you know, with another trio. And I know, you know, the Interpol wasn't always a trio, and, and, and now it is. But is there something that works for you with three? I mean, three is the magic number, right? I guess they say that in bands. It does feel, <laughs> it, it does feel like a good kind of number because you can't really get stalemates on issues but i feel like it really just boils down to chemistry you know i think we we're fortunate enough with the, our temperaments and our personalities and our experience to i think be very amenable collaborators and i think there's just no there's no tension there's no weird ego stuff it's all just kind of positive creative energy which is something that you know i think i'm i'm a little doing a little bit better of bringing that sort of energy to all, all my projects and including interpol um but it's kind of a state of mind that i've arrived at over many years of collaborating and i feel like same with these guys like they've just we've all been here done that and it's kind of you know an epiphany to me is sort of like that the whole process can be joyful and i feel like i've often <laughs> been in a mode of sort of suffering and brooding for my work not, I mean, not always, but it's just this was a very fun project for me. And I think it's kind of informing my other collaborations as well. As it's written, too, you've mostly been, you know, the lyricist in, in everything and you've written your vocal parts. And I guess that's not the exact way that Muzz happened. How has it been different for you being vocally directed and, and having to sing someone else's lyrics? Because it's not the same as doing a cover, right? I mean, this is, you know, from from the start. 
agreed. Yeah, we we didn't do a great job with our bio on this one. Uh, we I think <laughs> I think we're a little misleading, but I think it's good because it does prompt a conversation. But basically, like I did write all the lyrics, but what was different is that they were there was many instances where Josh was just kind of not feeling one of my lyrics, and so he would say that's kicking me out, and then I would kind of go back to the drawing board and rework a lyric um, and kind of like found that over time that there's sort of facets of my style musically that just doesn't really work for Matt and Josh. And it's kind of like poses or postures or kind of writing and character that I, that I might use and enjoy using in other outlets that for these guys is kind of like not that. Mm -hmm. So what was particularly interesting for me was just these conversations that I'd have with my bandmates about like, um, abstract approaches to lyric writing or like if someone doesn't like a lyric rather than Josh saying kind of like use these words he would sort of say what if you just kind of go off on a tangent using imagery that's evocative relative to the narrative rather than continuing the narrative in a literal way so just like like workshoppy kind of stuff with uh -huh. lyric writing which was which made it all a lot more collaborative than what I'm really used to uh, in a really fun way. And I'm, I've actually always been open to feedback with regards to my lyrics. It's just I haven't really gotten all that much <laughs> in my career. So this, I think Josh had a real vision of like what kind of spoke to him and what doesn't speak to him. And so there was not a few instances of <laughs> him kind of saying this one moment is kicking me out. Of course, you know, while we're on the lyrics, I'll bring that up because one thing you have talked about is, you know, because it was written over such a long period of time, I, I would find it interesting that you would find a thread at all. But that you've talked about there have been musings on mental health. I think that was the phrase you used. That's really interesting to me because because that's coming up more and more in a lot of, of music and in, in a lot of songs, but also in the wider artistic conversation than I think has in the past. Uh, I know it's being talked a lot about it in, in interviews. Do you find that that's something that's actually being discussed more in the art uh, the artist community itself? I don't know. Depression or mood swings and, and art making kind of go hand in hand. So I feel like it's always been between the lines of almost every medium. There's some sort of uh, something that's not quite hunky dory going on. I think that's at the root of a lot of art. So I, I feel like among artists or in an artistic like context, I think it's always been present. I feel like it is kind of just a little bit more mainstream. And I kind of commend people that have been of late coming forward and talking about, you know, mental health issues and depression and volunteering that information about themselves. I, I think it's really commendable. There's a couple of athletes that I follow that have been really candid and a few, you know, musicians. And I think it's good because I do think mental health is still something that is it's I wouldn't say that it's stigmatized like it used to be, but I think it's not entirely well understood. I think it's hard for people to grasp the idea of it being a, a condition like, you know, diabetes, for instance, or a disease. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think people coming coming forward and, and being very vocal about their own experience with depression, for instance, is is helpful. I, I don't want to push this in in a direction maybe that it's not intended to go. But considering the timeline of when these songs were put out, is it a coincidence that this was recorded over the years that our political arena was also tossed upside down? Because for a lot of folks, that is where some of this depression is coming from. Yeah, but that's depression with a reason. Sure. I think, you know, kind of some many, many issues with, you know, chemical or, or um, clinical depression is like there's no there's no reason. There's no element in your life that's causing it. It's just the thing that's happening. But I feel like, you know, times of great political turmoil and upheaval are a great time for art. So I think I think there's definitely yeah, people have a reason to be depressed and angsty. And I think that'll be, uh, you know, good fuel for a lot of art and maybe some kind of like real um you know, maybe we'll get back to some kind of punk rock style music. I'm a big fan of this band Surfboard. I don't know if you know them. Uh -huh. but yeah, yeah, yeah. Love their energy. You get that from one of the songs with a, I don't know, I took it from one of the songs, I should say, with a Red Western Sky. I mean, that, it sounds like it's actually begging for direction in the lyrics. Yeah, I think for sure. It's a, like It's like a vision quest kind of song. And I think that idea of, yeah, sort of surrender and opening to... You know, I mean, that song is also kind of like mystical and, and mystical spiritual, mm -hmm. which is just a, a vein that I enjoy indulging in creatively and conceptually. It's like something I like it resonates with me, that kind of archetype of the wandering in the desert and self-discovery and some ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that one and, and even the imagery that you're saying leads to, you know, some of the parts about the sounds on this, too. And maybe it was Josh talking in a previous interview about, you know, stretching for classic sounds. And I didn't exactly know what he meant by that, but I do find that 
even thinking back to the only other time that we've talked during the last Interpol record, I, I think I was complimenting you on, I could tell there was a change in your vocal style even, that it was more of this Sinatra style of crooning or whatever and, and matching that with what you guys are doing musically. I mean, were you looking at any musical touch points when you were talking about these songs? Were there any sounds that you were uh, looking to grab onto? Yeah, I think... I mean, I think Dave Fridman and who worked with Interpol on the last record uh, and Josh kind of had in common a sense of wish wanting me to explore a little less of a pushy vocal style, which I kind of think, you know, in being in rock bands, I sort of like a, a shoutier delivery. And I think it's been a good exercise for me to kind of pull it back and explore that facet of my singing. And I think, yeah, both the last Interpol record and this record have been good ways for me to explore that. Uh, I think in terms of kind of touch points that we talked about, uh, Leonard Cohen was a big one, mm-hmm. Neil Young, Bob Dylan, um, Josh is way into the band. And so and in terms of kind of like classic recording techniques, it's sort of basically not utilizing all the tricks of uh, Pro Tools or, or just sort of like, you know, the software approach that you can take with a lot of music now, of kind of quantizing everything and or using samples from you know bundles that come with your with your music program right. we were sort of using you know a real farfisa and a real organ and a real Wurlitzer and really nice amplifiers really nice microphones and really nice instruments and just kind of keeping the signal chain really vintage so there's just nothing on it that should make you kind of feel like oh okay this is definitely recorded between 2015 and 2020 and i think there's a lot of kind of telltale technology and sounds that could be on a record that would give that away and we were very intentionally not you know using any of that that's probably why i felt you know such a quick connection to it too because it is real and and there are those moments of it i, I gotta quickly compliment before i forget um the song evergreen and, and that groove that's going on in evergreen i i really think this is probably my favorite on the record i mean those guitars sound so good what you guys are doing so thanks man I got to, I got to, you know, I, I don't know how much of this kind of shit I should volunteer, but most of the guitar stuff you're hearing is going to be Josh. It's just throwing it out there. The compliments, you know, to the, to the whole group on that record. It's, um, you know, or that song, especially it's, it's so much good stuff happening there. Cool, but, man. I love that one. Thanks. Yeah. Now that you've got multiple groups, uh, and, and I don't know who's active and who's not, and I don't know if that's important to the question or not, but do you feel a service or obligation to keep them alive, to keep them all alive or, or does some of them mean to have a stopping point? It's, I don't feel an obligation to keep them alive. I just kind of want them all to be alive. So I feel like, you know, Banks and Steels, I would love us to make another record. If and when time uh, and scheduling permits, Interpol will definitely be making more records. Uh, and that's, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, loyalty to the fans and to the band, but kind of most, the biggest motivator for me is just that I like being in Interpol and uh, making music with those guys. So... There will be more work um, in all of my projects, is my hope. It looks like it's a lot of fun to juggle all those balls, I think is what I was saying. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It's cool to keep up with. Uh, Paul, I certainly appreciate what you're doing. I I love hearing this, and especially when a new surprise comes around like this. Uh, I'm so into this record, so uh, I'm glad you guys did it. Thank you for the music, and, uh, and thank you for taking the time to talk to me today about it, too. It's a real pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, man. Take care out there, and we'll okay. see you around. All right. Likewise. Bye. Bye. My thanks to Mr. Paul Banks. Again, Muzz, the new self-titled record. Definitely check it out. Now, I referenced in that interview that the last time Paul and I were talking was during the last Interpol record. Uh, you can find that in the series, but I thought I'd go ahead and include it here while we're here. So this is uh, back on the record Marauder, the Interpol record Marauder. And we also talked about touring Turn on the Bright Lights for its 15th anniversary, being inspired by uh, Sinatra-era crooners, and plenty more from all of that as well. So uh, why not? Part two, Kyle Meredith with Paul Banks. Hi there. Great to talk to you. Thanks for doing this, and, uh, and congrats on the new album. Thank you very much. It's always a fun little phrase that I'm working on, congrats on the new album. I think you all are towed that a lot, but I'm never exactly... <laughs> sure what that means to an artist that's customary that's that's pretty no no much appreciated i think it's sort of like uh yeah congrats on um it's it's i think it's the right comment yeah okay it's like you plans, did it plans well <laughs> yeah man <laughs> bringing something into the world that's right i, I kind of want to start where i know it's it seems like a lot of people have started and that's in the last couple of years because it seems like the history has been swirling around you all before this and i don't know if that's more of a projection 
from from like my side of things, from like the interviewer's side of things, or if you really feel that. But but with the 15th anniversary of Turn on the Bright Lights and doing that tour, with the meet me in the bathroom kind of putting the whole story together, with it really being you know, about 20 years since the band started, does it seem like any of that ended up finding its way into playing into how this record sounds and, and, and exists? I think that the experience of, of being on the road and, and doing the concerts around Bright Lights kind of refreshed our, our minds and, and bodies about what live feels like and, and sort of solidified this idea that this is where the songs wind up, is you know here on the stage with our, with our fans in front of us. And I think we kind of kept uh, a sense of that in the recording studio. Like, let's not... Let's like let's let this record capture a live feeling, and so that sort of means not too many overdubs and you know really run them down performances where it's sort of not not about stopping and fixing or doing fifty takes and then you know piecing it all together. It's just more the band in the room playing straight to tape, and and I think by being on the road with with bright lights, it just got us in that headspace of that sort of simplicity of live music. Because I know no band wants to, you know, be stuck in the past whatsoever. It's always about moving forward. But there is a sense of this one, especially, I guess, compared to the last couple ones, like, man, there's a really strong classic Interpol sound to this, which I don't think anybody's complaining about whatsoever. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I think I'm, I'm super excited about this record. And if it if it sounds classic within the context of our sound, that, that sounds great to me, too. There was also the, uh, the Banks and Steel stuff in there. You know, you, I know you'd always been... You've always been a big hip hop fan, you know. That's where a lot that you came from uh, musically, you know, as far as youth goes, at least that I've read about anyway. And, and sort of a similar question, you know, it seems like to me that would have been a dream to have had, you know, all of those artists being able to kind of do something with them. Was that was that a good itch to finally scratch? It was. You know, it it wasn't so much that there was an itch to you know, record with, with necessarily those musicians. I think it was really just, I'm a fan of the genre and I'm a huge fan of RZA's. And it turned out that RZA and I have a good creative dynamic. So, you know what I mean? It wasn't, I didn't really have expectations or I hadn't really had a formal thought in my mind, like one day, you know, I'll make a record like this. It was just that from a really good creative rapport that, that RZA and I have, you know, that record came out of that process. And then that, yeah, it allowed us to work with Method Man and Master Killa and Cool Keith is on there and Florence. It was, it was a fantastic experience. It was a really great sort of grand collaborative process for me. And just the timing of it all seems insane because doing that record, touring that record, touring the Bright Lights record, and then, I don't know, at some point you found time to get inspired to go in and, and write the Marauder. I mean, where does that all come from, you know, this timing-wise for you? I mean, all of these things do seem to take a long time behind the scenes. The RZA record we worked on for, for years, we were, you know, demoing tracks for that project. And with Interpol, I think it's just another kind of testament to, I think, the beauty of collaboration because it's not, there's something very reactive when you have a good band chemistry. So if I'm, say, I'm stuck for ideas, but then Daniel starts playing an incredible chord progression, then all of a sudden I get a flood of ideas. So I think that's what keeps things refreshed. Uh, I think if you're a solo artist just putting out, you know, albums that you write and record, I think there's probably, uh, you're going to perhaps encounter that burnout of creativity sooner. But when you get to work with other people who sort of trigger your creativity and are filling in a lot of gaps in the total picture, then it's just really a joy of kind of um, bouncing around ideas with people so that generates its own energy in a way you, you seem to have fun with maybe the characters of the stories i mean I, and, and i say that in a way like when i talk to a lot of artists they'll write a song and they'll figure out what it means years later kind of a thing subconsciously uh, there's something about yours yeah. that that almost feels like i don't know like you're writing these tiny movies inside the songs and, and we hear that you know as you talk about you know, what's going on in a song like number 10 uh, obviously, the rover, you know, in that first single. I mean, how, it, it, does that still is that still sort of how it works for you this time around? I mean, are, are you kind of making mini movies, or are these still like any other artist, maybe like Stream of Consciousness, and like, oh wow, that's a cool story that came from nowhere? Yeah, I think it's 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 a mixture of things. I definitely like the idea of them being mini movies. I often see a lot of visuals, like I make I make loads of videos to our songs in my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I think a song like The Rover did kind of write itself in that way where it's sort of like, a, you know, a, a character outside of myself that I do sort of just 
fall into this world and it's sort of it is like following a character around and just thinking what would this person say and then there's a lot of fun in writing dialogue that would be if 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 it were like a screenplay that you're writing it's like dialogue that isn't you know close to your experience but it's something that you're fascinated by and you get to like write for the villain for instance <laughs> and i but i also think in terms of things being kind of cinematic you know there's the structure to to the music of a song. So I think, you know, Daniel has a great architecture to the pieces that he presents to the band. And then filling, you know, the vocal component of that is also following that blueprint of where the music moves from section to section. So it's, it is a, it's a, a collaborative process that I think allows us to get that cinematic quality. And I should bring up the Rover while we're here. Um, I, I wonder if I'm reaching, but it seems like, you know, when you have a song about sort of a cult figure, you know, preaching doomsday in a way. That seems like really interesting timing in, in an era where narcissism is, is sort of running rampants <laughs> around the country. And I, I wonder if there is any parallel with maybe what's happening in, in the real world. I mean, I do think that there's a, it's, it's a fun thing. I think it is, it's a resonant archetype. You know, this, this person who sort of speaks without a filter or says very outlandish things that at the core of them is like a pretty simple message. And I think then what can happen is a large group of people can sort of just like identify with this simple message and they get caught up in the conviction of the person who's saying it. But that person may not be a, you know, a really measured thinker who's sort of taking a lot of things into get sort of a little bit more flash and bluster. And I feel like there's a part of us that sort of can respond to that. So it's I just think it's a human phenomena that happens often uh, and in a way I think maybe measured thinking is a little or subtle thinking might not appeal to you know uh, <laughs> oh <laughs> it's it's it's, a, it's just a gosh how do I dig myself out of this hole <laughs> I don't know I just think I think that uh, there's a there's a dynamic that can happen anywhere at any time in human history and that sort of, I think, the character of a cult leader speaking something very exaggerated and can resonate with a following. I think it's just something that happens through time, and it's it's an interesting phenomenon. So, and again, maybe I'm going down the wrong path, but it, the reason why I sort of went that direction, too, is because when I hear about the artwork, that it's in this long way tied to Richard Nixon and, and that whole campaign. And, and that's what I mean. It's like, man, there are all these things kind of swirling around, and maybe that's just the universe kind of put them in place like that but it, but it looks very interesting in that sense yeah i mean it's a very powerful image and i think it, it does it kind of resonates on a few different frequencies and you can look at it through different prisms whether it be that you know you see some kind of overtones of political commentary or a parallel with the landscape today or if you just look at it as a piece of photography which is just a striking shot of a guy at a table seemingly very vulnerable and very powerful at the same time i think it just sort of it, it works in a number of ways and I feel, yeah, I feel lucky. I think the design came out great for this album cover. That the, that character in the rover, have you ever written multiple songs about one idea? Because it feels like there could be more to that story musically. Like, if you were ever looking for that, you know, that thematic string of songs, I feel like you've got it right there. Yeah, there could be a longer arc to that character for sure. I think, I mean, it was sort of fun when we when we did the video for that song. The The narrative that we sort of set up there became like the prequel to what you hear in the song. And so it's like, wow, this character, you know, we've already sort of started to build that world where he exists beyond just the lyrics to the track. And so, yeah, we've got a prequel, we've got the song, and then maybe there could be, a, you know, the saga continues, you know, the rover goes west. <laughs> what, what, what is it usually? It's, it's, it's usually here. like, yeah, it takes, takes New York or it takes Manhattan. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, <laughs> And I, and I guess that sort of segs into how you've talked about maybe the, the bigger character in it uh, behind, you know, the Marauder um, as, as sort of a version of a past you in a, in a way. I, like, I'd wonder, like, is this the type of character you hear about the next day? Like, what the hell happened last night type of character? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I sort of don't have, I've never had the experience of sort of waking up and saying, like, what did I do? You know, I've never had a blackout, but I think it definitely, it's it's that part of, yeah, it's that part of you that maybe wakes up with some thoughts of like, what, <laughs> what's going on with my life? I think it is a little bit, um, it's that loose, messy part of us that, that comes up sometimes, the, uh, the irresponsible, reckless part. Because, you know, again, and in, in, in it's an, an age that you're able to finally look at that. What I, what I wonder is, you know, for a lot of artists, the next, the, the next turn that you would be looking at is, I don't know, the midlife album, I guess, is what it comes to. Like, oh, and, and this is what happens now to that guy. 
Yeah, well, I mean, but I think, you know, this idea of a marauder, you know, that could be an approach that you take to the stock market. It's, I think it's something that's always there. It's that part of you that sort of walks a little too close to the edge. It's, it's not really, uh, you know, localized just to youth. I think it's, you know, it's just that wild streak that I think we all have. I, I want to ask about another song because I don't know anything about it, and it's become one of my favorites. It's the one that closes the record uh, called It Probably Matters. I've really been hooked on that one. Uh, I, you know, and it comes across in so in, in several different ways to me. Like in one sense, I heard it as an apology, and, and in another sense, I heard it as a reflection. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could talk about what's what what might be happening in that song. I mean, I think that it's kind of like you you can come through an experience with a little gem of wisdom, uh, and that that gem of wisdom, like you're going to carry that sort of forward. So it's it's also kind of like, all right, how does this uh, information impact? you know, my next move. And so, but it's sort of through this dark phase or this, you know, traumatic event that happened that you gain this wisdom. So there is sort of a, you know, there's a, there's an upside that you're a wiser person now, but then there's that sense of what next. And, and, um, you know, am I going <laughs> to, how long will I carry this piece of wisdom or will it just get lost in my satchel? <laughs> yeah. So I think it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I don't know about an apology. I think it's a little bit just more reflective. And then there's that sense of looking ahead with some encouragement. Your vocals are doing a really cool strut sort of in that uh, almost, um, I don't know, as I hear it anyway, uh, a little bit of that Sinatra Vegas, a uh, little Tom Jones, whatever you Ooh, mean. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> A little loungy. It's a little loungy. I mean, and of course, against the music, right. you have a very Interpol esque type of song going on behind that. But, but yeah, there's a bit of a strut over that, and yeah. I mean, I like that that term. Uh, <laughs> strut sounds good, and and I definitely yeah, it's cool. I think it's that was a piece of music that I was really really partial to while we were building this record. That was a song that I really wanted to get the vocal right, and I just felt like we were we were onto something. It was it's an atmosphere that I think is is really nice in that track in particular, and I think Fridman did a great job helping us realize that it, it becomes this quite a broad, expansive song. But I think I did kind of, I, I think the atmosphere in my mind when you bring up like lounge singers or crooners, that did feel like the atmosphere that it evoked for me in the first place. And then I think we got to even take it further. I love it. Uh, we have heard a little bit about, you know, there, there were several songs left off of this that could have easily been on the record given a different track list. And a lot of those get left behind, but is there any desire to, to maybe put those out in some fashion before, you know, the anniversary edition rolls around? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think we, we certainly, we've, every song that we finished, we really like. So I think sometimes you do have to edit an album and you do have to kind of curate which songs best complement each other, but that doesn't mean that, you know, a song that might get left off is any less good, really. There's just, you know, they can't all come to the party. So I think we definitely have some intention of uh, letting that music be heard. Yeah, but cool. uh, more to come on that. <laughs> all right. We're baited. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you, Paul, so much for this. And again, congratulations on The Marauder, and I really do mean that. Uh, I love this record, and, uh, and I can't wait to see how this one sounds, uh, sounds live out there. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, man. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. That interview there with Paul Banks talking about the Interpol record Marauder back in uh, 2018. So again, thanks to Paul. Thanks to you for checking out this series. Before you get out of here, I hope if you're not already that you will hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening from. iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get podcasts from. Just type in Kyle Meredith with. We'll deliver new interviews to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday so you can keep up with your favorite artists, uh, discover new ones, know what's happening in the music world. Again, it's Kyle Meredith with wherever you get podcasts from. After that, head to WFPK.org, where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews, too. Again, that's a WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound has your music and film news. You can find me on just about any social media platform, at Kyle Meredith. Hope you follow and like in the appropriate places. That does it for another edition of Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. Do you read Stephen King? Good news. There's a club for you. The Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. 
Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights.